Good evening, and welcome to Let's Just Talk. I'm your host, Hami. Today, we'll be addressing a topic that has been devastating cities and affecting families across America, which is the impact of gun violence. Our guest, our guest will help us understand, address, and detail how we can effectively address and reduce urban gun violence. Today, we are joined by Dr. Ted Landsmark from the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University, and Dr. Jack McDevitt from the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northeastern University. This is not simply an academic conversation for me, but a personal one. I grew up in the Bronx, New York, where everyone that I knew knew of someone that had either died or been affected by gun violence. And I have friends who have lost siblings, cousins, and close ones. And I personally can tell you stories many stories, in fact, of people that I know who are affected by this epidemic. And growing up at times, it felt hopeless. Um, and it seemed as though policymakers and lawmakers constantly seemed to miss the bullseye on, this, on addressing this issue, which left me wondering at times, uh, is it that policymakers simply do not understand the plight of children in underserved communities, ghettos, urban cities, inner cities, whatever you want to call it, or is it a lack of care? What is it about this issue that makes it so intractable? And to begin, we're going to have, give each of our guests five to seven minutes to offer their perspective on this issue. And then we'll dive into questions that will shed more light on this topic and the best ways in which we can address and reduce urban gun violence. Jack McDevitt, if you want to start us off. You have the floor. Sure. Thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me to be here and us to have this conversation. It is an important topic, and um, it, it's one that sometimes gets conversations that are very passionate, and we miss some of the ways we might be able to more effectively deal with it. So um, just to give a little bit of background about my work, um, I first started doing work on gun violence. I, I direct the Institute for Race and Justice. And we do social science research on topics that involve race and the justice system. Um, so my first little foray was uh, into looking at Massachusetts passed a gun law called the Bartley Fox gun law that was made it a mandatory one year in jail if you had a gun without a license. And that was very controversial at the time and went to was one of the early mandatory penalties in the justice system. And there was lots and lots of uh, angst about that law. Um, and people, the part I did research on was how the courts handled it. And the courts went through lots of gyrations to not have judges be forced to give a particular sentence, to leave the judge open to have discretion. But what it turned out was that the law did, in fact, reduce gun violence. That what happened in that case was that people left their guns at home for fear of having to go to jail for a year. They did the same behaviors. They got into the same arguments. But what happened was they didn't have a gun there. Mm. So they might be angry at someone, and they might hit them with a bottle or a chair, but you don't kill people that way. Right. And so they didn't have a gun. So then in 2014, I was asked by the Speaker of the House to lead a group that would take a look at Massachusetts legislation and make recommendations for how to make the gun laws in Massachusetts stronger. And you know, following what Ted has done for his whole career, I, I brought in different stakeholder groups and we had a, a, a committee that met regularly for eight months and listened to different groups and different opinions. And we made a series of recommendations. Now, let me say this, that when we started, Massachusetts had really good gun laws, better than most states. Uh, but when we, were, when we started, Massachusetts was ranked fourth, which is great, out of 50 states, as the safest state for gun violence. But we found some things we could change, and we can talk about the details of that as we go through this, that could make it even safer. Okay. And one of the things we said was, when you're thinking about the argument of, okay, well, we, we've got lots of good laws in Massachusetts, and we're the fourth <coughs> safest state in, in the country, and that's great, 
we reframed that argument to how do we compare against Europe? And when you compare us against Europe, w far, far too many gun deaths are happening. And so we reframed the argument, how can we be as good as, as safe as Europe is? And I guess one of the things I'm really proud of is that after we made the recommendations to the Speaker of the House, and he very courageously got that legislation passed, and that was a very heavy lift for him to get it passed, we went from being the fourth safest state to being the safest state. We continue to be the safest state for gun violence in the country. Um, not as safe as Europe. We could still get better, right. but we're, we're doing better. And, and I, I think I guess I leave you with the thought that public policy can make a difference. And on some topics, it can save lives. Mm -hmm. And this is one indication where you know, the way the laws are written and the way the laws are implemented can help us to make a society better and save people's lives. Ted? Um, well, like you, I grew up in New York City um, in uh, public housing development in East Harlem. Uh, and so I was surrounded by all of the measures of uh, violence uh, that uh, one normally encounters um, in impoverished neighborhoods, right. uh, <clears throat> in public housing, um, in the midst of uh, an economy that uh, reduces the opportunities for young people to mm. uh, get employment uh, that can really lead to career growth right. uh, in the absence of educational opportunities and the like. Um, so I knew all of that. I had felt that. I had experienced that within my family. Um, but I didn't become deeply involved uh, in issues of how one goes about um, solving mm -hmm. uh, the, the problems attendant to gun violence until uh, I went to work uh, in City Hall in Boston under Mayor uh, Ray Flynn. And the city got to a point where it um, established uh, the very uh, dubious record of, of having the uh, largest number of murders take place in the city mm. um, in its history. And um, at that moment, it, it became clear to a lot of people outside of uh, the community uh, that there were very negative uh, long-term implications to uh, permitting any kind of uh, violence and gun violence in particular to continue. Uh, there were negative uh, economic implications. People couldn't get insurance for their homes. Uh, the uh, hospitals found themselves becoming specialists in certain types of, of uh, gun violence and shooting violence and the like. Uh, there were all the mental health issues that arose. And so a number of people came together um, across the city, several hundred, um, the community people and uh, professionals, academics, uh, uh, people in uh, public safety, law enforcement officers, uh, lawyers and others, uh, and developed uh, something that came to be known as the Safe Neighborhoods Plan um, that entailed uh, providing opportunities for uh, people in the communities uh, providing services uh, to address issues of drug use and the like, um, involved realtors and educators and social workers and uh, uh, people who had uh, been military veterans who uh, were looked up to by young uh, folks in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and we developed a set of strategies, many of which focused on guns and their availability. Uh, as Jack has pointed out, uh, two people can get into an argument in a bar or on a street corner. Uh, if one of them uh, is carrying a gun, uh, the consequence of that argument uh, tends to be fatal. Right. Um, if, if people are simply using their fists or a broken bottle, the uh, uh, likelihood of someone actually being killed goes down uh, uh, significantly. And so we focused on gun violence. and. In the course of doing that, we realize that there are a lot of things going on mm. uh, that make it difficult to 
uh, arrest that kind of violence. First of all, it's a regional issue. Right. Uh, Massachusetts uh, is noted for uh, having gun manufacturers who produce a lot of guns, uh, but a lot of the guns that end up on the street and in gun violence uh, don't originate uh, in Massachusetts or even from within New England. Um, there are federal laws that uh, come into play around uh, what kinds of penalties uh, get imposed. Mm -hmm. uh, there are cultural issues. One has to ask oneself, why is it that a 14 or 15 or 16 year old feels that they need to carry uh, some sort of uh, armament on the street in an ongoing way or even have one uh, near oneself, you know, when you go to bed at night. Why is it uh, that uh, uh, people feel that there's a need to um, have a gun around? W what are the larger social factors that uh, lead to that kind of violence? Mm. And then uh, we, we had to also acknowledge that the issue at its root is really a public health issue. I mean, obviously, dying is a public health issue, right. but dying uh, by gun violence is a public health issue to which one can take a, a somewhat uh, epidemiological approach. Right. Most of the people who are shot and killed know the person who shot them. Um, most of the people who uh, carry a gun uh, don't necessarily use it, but there are some people who may be carrying um, who will actually pull a trigger uh, aimed at, at another individual. Uh, there are questions of uh, how one goes about responding to a shooting right. uh, the moment it has happened. We found um, that we were able in, in the city through uh, the participation of a lot of different people at many different levels, um, we were able to reduce the murder rate in the city by 80%. And it's, it's an extraordinary <laughs> number looking back on it. Right. And we went through two years where there wasn't a single teenager in the city who was killed. But in order to make that happen, we had to have the support of community folks and parents and grandparents. We had to put street workers on the street to work with uh, gang members. We had to uh, address issues of opioid addiction and, uh, uh, and drug use in general. We had to disrupt uh, some of the economics. Uh, that uh, were leading people to feel that they had to carry guns and actually use them. Yeah. Um, we had to redeploy where we put our uh, emergency uh, people and facilities on right. those evenings when we knew that a shooting was more likely to take place than not in order to get someone who was shot into an emergency room or into treatment more quickly, and that saved lives. But the overall issue of gun violence is an issue that at its root goes back to the founding of this country where um, it, it was almost taken as a given uh, that uh, individuals uh, could and indeed should carry a weapon. Right. Um, and that, uh, that uh, right to carry a weapon um, is in some people's minds um, deeply embedded in the Constitution. Right. Um, and there are people who are carrying guns who clearly should not be carrying guns right. who say that they're doing it not so much because they have an intent to use the weapon, but more because they believe that it's a, a symbol of their freedom and their ability to um, exercise a, a personal agency. Right. Um, and so they end up carrying guns when uh, they clearly should not be carrying guns. And mm. I think that um, looking forward, we have to think about uh, some of those deep cultural issues of why someone feels compelled right. uh, to carry a gun, why there are so many guns in the, US. Uh, in the United States in comparison with uh, any other uh, country in, in, the, in the world, world, why ammunition itself is so readily available. Right. Um, uh, you know, there are people who say, well, if you simply stop the sale of ammunition, uh, eventually, uh, the guns would become useless. Well, why is ammunition available? And why is it that legislators who could take a firm stand against the use of guns and take a stand in favor of the liability of the manufacturers and users of those guns, why is it that the legislators themselves continue to feel that this 
right to carry overweighs the right of the public to feel safe. Right. Um, and I would hope that uh, we would get into uh, some detailed discussion of that uh, in this conversation. I also want to draw a, 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 diff a comparison and a difference between legal gun ownership and illegal gun ownership. Because the 15, 14, 16 year olds to like 24 year olds that are owning guns in inner cities are not purchasing it legally, but they have it widely available. And uh, so could we, I want us to address that as well. And I want us, you started touching on it, Ted. Um, in matter of fact, you touched on many layers of it. So through approaching this issue through a systems thinking, systems thinking approach lens, um, there are multiple layers at play with this issue of gun violence. I want us to sort of explain those layers to the audience, the historical um, reasons ghettos, inner cities are the way they are, because whether you, you're, you're in Chicago, whether you're in um, Memphis, or you're in Missouri, or New York City, or Detroit, the issue is the same. Young black men are dying at an alarming rate, and it seems that people are not doing enough about it. And so there are multiple layers here. People are not just killing each other because they want to kill each other, but what are the reasons why, like you said, Ted, this is happening to our young people, and why are we not doing enough to alleviate the issue? And so if we can get into the different uh, layers of the problem and just outline them for our audience, outline the, the different layers to our audience, and we can get into the discussion on how to address those different layers. Because like you said, Massachusetts has addressed it. Massachusetts is not that different from New York City. So why aren't we trying to implement the same thing in other areas of the country? Um, why, aren't we taking, why aren't we taking a federal approach to the issue? So I'm gonna leave the issue up to you and then we'll tackle the rest. Sure, sure. No, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot to your question. Right. Um, you know, one of the things we find when we do surveys of young people is that they believe they're in danger and they believe that they're in danger from some of their peers if they happen to be in a local crew or gang and they're afraid that what would happen there, but they also feel they're in danger with the police. And they feel that they're in danger in a whole variety of dis different situations. So they feel that being armed is a form of protection. Now one of the things that happens is that not every kid in the city can afford or have, have with them a gun, but what, what does happen is we have shared guns. And, you know, as many of you know, th what they'll do is bury a gun already disassembled in some kind of plastic case where all of a certain group of people will know where that gun is in case they need to get it. And, you know, that, th that's shared across a particular gang or a particular group of kids who li live on the same street. So there's this fear out there, and it's not an ill-founded fear of being a victim of violence. At the same time, as Ted said, when Boston went through that more than two year period where there were no deaths of young people, it was a series of coalitions, as Ted mentioned, that came together um, and uh, uh, on both sides. So the police were the ones trying to deal with it and all of a sudden they partnered with probation and probation had a whole new set of intelligence that the police didn't have. Mm -hmm. They knew that so-and-so <coughs> was in their office because he's on probation and he was saying that this group's fighting with this group or this person has you know, got into a beef with this person over here and they could predict where violence was going. And so by talking to each other, they started to get together. And then as Ted said, there were community groups, there were city agencies. And one thing that was unique to Boston and they tried to replicate this across the country, and this part was hard to replicate, was the clergy. The clergy stepped up in a big way in Boston. I mean, there was a horrible situation in Morning Star Baptist Church where you know, the, there was a shooting there um, during a funeral of a young person who was a victim of gun violence, and they came, the, the kids who had shot him came into the, to the service. But you know, the clergy sort of said, we, we're gonna just minister to these young people. And not every kid was going to respond to the clergy, but at that point in time, it was a new thing to have ministers on the street saying, 
you know, can we talk? Can we help you get back into school? Can we help you and mom get a job? Can we help this? And it's fascinating that when we tried to replicate that across the country, one of the things that happened was a number of clergy said, if we have those people in our congregation, some of the other people in the congregation won't come. Mm. They won't come to services because they're scared of these young people. Right. And so it was really a courageous thing that, that the Boston clergy did. And they did not fight for credit or fight for you know, resources for themselves. They really were trying to work through the, with, with the young people. And so working with the city, working with the agencies that Ted referenced, um, you know, the prosecutor's office, the probation, the police, it was a, a incredible coming together, you know, because the average number of homicides in Boston coming up to the year, 1990, that Ted was talking about, was 90. Now, at that time, New York City had 2,000 homicides a year. So we, we were doing a lot better than New York City, but 90 is a lot. In 1990, it spiked to 152. Never had seen anything like that before. You know, for, for the people who weren't here then, every day the newspapers would run a body count on the front page. You know, we're at 89, we're at 103, we're at 137. It was a new record every day and they were, it was just, it, people were just so fed up and so scared and it was just a terrible, terrible time that it brought all of these different groups together to put away some of their normal turf battles and to say, you know, we have to save the lives of the young people. And, uh, and so I think that that was a, the, a reflection of the kind of effort that we need today, uh, a coming together of all, a broad spectrum of different groups to sort of prioritize gun violence as a problem. Yeah, I think we were um, fortunate in that uh, we tried something innovative that started really with a, a very high level of community engagement. We asked mm -hmm. a lot of different people uh, what, if it were to happen, would change uh, the trajectory that we we're on around uh, uh, murders and gun violence. And uh, then a lot of uh, uh, different people and groups pitched in to help. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at, at what's going on now, the, the uh, factors that I find most troubling is that um, we recognize that there is a lot of stress in many of our communities and that that stress has increased uh, during COVID because of it. Um, uh, there are more people dying who uh, one would uh, never have anticipated would die at the age that they've, uh, that they've passed. Um, uh, but underneath it all, there's this uh, question of how one goes about uh, redirecting mm -hmm. the um, anger that exists in many communities, well-founded anger and well-founded fear, as right. you said. Um, how does one go about redirecting that mm. um, into the kinds of activities where people don't feel um, that a gun is gonna be the solution to it? Right. Um, uh, how, how does one really go about getting uh, the guns off the streets in a way that addresses uh, the fears mm. uh, that, that folks have, because the fact of the matter is, and this is where uh, statistics are interesting, but, the, but they often don't help us much. Right. The average young person who's afraid of uh, being accosted by a police officer, for example, or pulled over, what have you, that average young person is not well served by carrying a gun. Uh, the moment they uh, reach to, to produce the gun, even if they say, I have a license, right. uh, one of the first things that happens is that they run the risk of getting shot. And a lot of people say, oh, I need to have a gun in my home to protect my home from potential intruders. Right. But what the statistics show is that it is more likely that a person will shoot themselves then than shoot an intruder who happens to be coming into the home. Right. Well, we've got that data, but that data hasn't translated into cultural change mm. in a way that reduces the propensity for an individual to keep a loaded gun in particular around. Yeah. Um, and particularly when you see uh, the, the stories of young kids 
who inadvertently pick up a gun and shoot a, a sibling or, or shoot a, 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 an adult or the gun goes off and the bullet passes through a wall and, and kills a neighbor, right. right? The question is, why is it that we feel that a gun is the way of solving a, a sense of insecurity right. when in fact having the gun around is more likely than not mm. uh, to lead to a death or at least uh, uh, harm and, and an insecure situation. And to my mind, that's partly a matter of our um, failing uh, in the educational system and through our right. uh, religious training and through uh, <coughs> uh, values that are passed down generation to generation. Right. We've failed to point out that carrying a gun or having a gun on one's person is more likely to lead to harm to that individual mm -hmm. than to be a source of, of security vis-a-vis -vis someone else. Yeah, um, I can bring real life experiences to this conversation in a sense that everything the both of you are saying are not just for our academic conversation here. And in the issue of safety, a lot of the times I've had conversations with people who are like, well, why do they have so many guns? Why do they shoot each other? Why have they been carrying, carrying guns? That's stupid. And it's like social psychologists or behavioral psychologists tell us that like the social norms in our communities dictate our attitudes and the way in which we act in that society. My high school was in the middle of four different projects and neighborhoods. Um, by projects, I mean public housing, for those of you that, who might not know what that is, that all had beef with each other. And it's like, I'm taking the bus to school every day where at 7 a.m. I'm seeing some kids beating another kid up and I'm like, that can be me, you know? And um, even I've had instances where I'm just a bystander and people have come up to me and be like, yo, where are you from? Like, what are you doing here? And so every single kid in my neighborhood is going through that. And so in the issue with policing as well, I've been walking home with my cousins and police have stopped us for no reason and harassed us and touched us in private places where they shouldn't be touching us and cursed us out and stuff like that. I was a victim of police brutality at the age of 15 for just standing in the wrong place, being in the wrong place at the wrong time and haven't done anything about it. And so that story is not unique to me at all. And we also have to take into consideration that um, no child in these neighborhoods wants to be dying or shooting each other. It's just that they've inherited a legacy of culture and things happening around them that have shaped their attitude and worldview in a certain way that they can't see past that. And so uh, you're watching your friends, your closest friends, somebody that you hang out with every single day, get shot and killed. And so it's like, what are you gonna do about that? The law, is not do the law and authority is not doing anything about it. Um, you probably have other people from other neighborhoods who are taunting your friend in music or in other areas of life about it. And I don't know, it just feels hopeless. And so to understand all of that, there is a generation of trauma being passed down. And so as a policy person, as an urban planner, um, I don't know of any mental health facilities in our neighborhoods. Could you speak to the role that mental health has when it comes to this issue? And how can we also provide more safety? How did the city of Boston go about making sure that the kids that you surveyed in for, your, for your research who were saying, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe, over time felt safe and not have to carry weapons? Well, it, it's a big question, but I think we do know that there are lots of good programs out there that work with kids that bring people in, as Ted said, from the street workers, people who've been on the streets. It doesn't, doesn't do you any good to bring somebody in from the suburbs who's never lived that lifestyle and try right. to relate to the kids. That's not going to happen. But somebody who they knew, who's the older brother or the uncle of somebody who's on the streets today, they know what the, the kids are seeing, they know what they're feeling. But, but we also have to be frank and true with young people that, you know, the statistics that Ted cited, that, that you're much more likely to have a gun used against you than use it to protect yourself. 
So we need to sort of think through how can we do things that will, when a kid feels most vulnerable, there's a place for them to go for help, to go for support. Mm -hmm. And it won't be the police, but it, it could be a program, it could be a street worker. We, we have some great street workers in Boston that have long-term relationship with young people who know what they're going against. And if there's a, all of a sudden word on the street that someone's out going to take a shot at someone, they can get in there and they call them violence interrupters. And they can get in there and sort of help that young person stay safe. But at the same time, when we did some work with some of those programs, it became a lot more, if you just deal with the young person on the street, you're not going to make a difference. Right. It's got to be the whole family and the extended family that is all, you know, if this is a, a family where nobody's working or the father's in prison or the mom has substance abuse problems, you got to deal with that too. Because just telling the young person don't carry guns is, is not going to work if their home life is, you know, a mess. Right. And so, you know, one of the programs they did at Boston, again, at the time that Ted, Ted was in City Hall, was they said, look, for those young people who are coming from these kind of violent situations, we're going to prioritize them to the top of the service list. Right. That they are going to not even get a waiting line if they want school tutoring help or if they want job training. We're going to get them that tomorrow. And we're going to say, this is a group of people that we prioritize services to so that they don't, they don't have a chance to just say, well, they'll never get to me. We're going to get to you right away. Okay. And, and that was a big part of that, was to learn that we had to, it, it's not like we have to treat everybody fairly. No, not everybody's risk, risk of exposure and violence is the same. Right. We should be treating people more who are m more high risk to be vi victims of violence. And, and I would just add that it's really important uh, to um, have mentors um, and people who have achieved some level of success uh, coming out of the community, right. uh, going back into the community to say, you know, there are alternatives. Right. Um, a, a large part of the reason, uh, in my experience, that young people decide to carry a gun is that they uh, will sometimes lack the internal confidence to feel uh, that they can uh, traverse the streets or have a life that is going to be a successful life unless they've got this implement with them. And so um, part of the challenge is to just build up a sense of, of internal uh, self-worth and confidence um, that uh, enables a young person to then feel uh, that they have a future. Right. Um, if, if you don't feel as though you have a future, then the, the risk that you assume of being shot while you are protecting yourself shooting someone else um, and it carries a very different value to it. And I think that that speaks to uh, the responsibility that mm -hmm. a lot of us have, those of us who um, have, have uh, found good jobs, gotten into unions, are construction workers, are academics, are uh, lawyers, teachers, whatever. We have an obligation to go back into our communities and to say, you know, mm -hmm. there are ways out of poverty and uh, insecurity and uh, mental health issues without necessarily having to carry a weapon in order to build up a sense of confidence and pride in oneself. Mm -hmm. um, I think the uh, street workers, um, when we uh, put them out uh, in communities at night when they were needed and not during you know, a nine to five work day, I think that they served as role models for what one could become. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in many of the communities we're working in, those kinds of role models um, haven't been doing a good enough job right. uh, in terms of bringing in more uh, to then uh, uh, indicate what the pathways are right. um, that uh, can lead to success uh, socially, personally, economically, uh, without necessarily having to resort to carrying a gun. Okay. Just to, to follow up on that, I think it's, it's really right on and important. And we had done a series of interviews with young people in the city of Boston, 14, 15, 16 year old young people who were saying they needed a gun. And a couple of things they told us that would have resonated with me. One was, when we talked to them about the future, 
At 14, they said, I won't be alive at 21. You know, I'm yeah. not going to be here. I, best case scenario, I'll be in prison or I'm dead. So don't talk to me about, you know, what, what's happened when I'm 30 because I don't, I'm not looking at that. I think I've got, you know, three or four years because so many people around them were dying, like the families that you were around. And then the second thing that was so sad to me was one young, people, one young person killed somebody at 13 and, you know, was going to go to prison for a very long time. And, um, you know, we were talking to him and he was saying, you know, he really had a goal. He really wanted to have a job. But he never thought he could never get there. He could never get this kind of job. And I said, what do you want to be? He said, a truck driver. And I thought to myself, if you can't, if you feel that you can't even be a truck driver, mm -hmm. then, you know, what's left for you? You know, right. what do you, what are your, you know, this person didn't want to be president of the United States or a doctor, want to be a truck driver. Right. And we can't see, see a pathway for that, to help that young person become a truck driver. That's what they want. That's our job. That's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about some historical pauses and historical facts. So ghettos or inner cities, there's so many names for them, did not become ghettos overnight. Um, there was a whole trajectory that led us here. Could you talk about the sort of urban planning choices or historical policy choices that have led to people in these neighborhoods living under the conditions that they're living now, they're living in now. Because a lot of the times what happens is you are growing up in this underserved community. Everybody else around you is going through the same thing and is just as poor as you, as deprived as you, um, going through the same problem. So in your head, this is the natural conditions that you should be living in. And this is the natural way that things are. But it turns out that the way we are living in these neighborhoods are generations of policies um, associated with some degree of personal responsibility. So could you touch on that a little bit? I, you know, I've been uh, uh, taking a look at uh, black communities in particular that have been successful in mm -hmm. the past. Right. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Atlanta, um, Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that uh, tied all of those communities together was that uh, uh, leadership and social organizations within those communities and educators in those communities were all working with each other to cycle the assets of the community back through the community. So whether it meant um, that the uh, local club uh, where artists could perform was supported by local people or the local grocery stores were supported by local residents, or the landlords understood that sometimes they might have to make concessions to people who might have lost a job. The strength of the community was that it looked within itself, and it built within itself, and it didn't look outside of itself for some form of gift or, or charitable donation or what have you, whether it was uh, the Black Masons, or the uh, uh, Black Sororities, or the teachers groups that came together, or the social workers who came together. Everyone was building the community from within and not looking to some external source uh, in order to provide the resources that could build the community. Mm -hmm. After the Second World War, there was a lot of legislated segregation that divided communities, uh, not only within themselves, but from other communities that could serve as um, uh, reinforcers of uh, the strength that existed within black communities. And I think there are a number of people who are now looking at um, efforts at uh, desegregation and the like, not only for the good things that came out of it, but mm -hmm. also for the things that weakened teachers' unions, for the things that weakened local education, for the things that made it harder for a local grocer or a local plumber to be supported within the community. Looking forward, I think that we need to um, look at those economic and social tools that built up the strengths of places like Tulsa and Wilmington and Harlem 
uh, in their heyday. The things that white people outside of those communities viewed as threatening right. because of the strengths that were obvious within the communities. We need to take a look at those forces mm. where communities support and build within themselves, have mentors, have people who stand out as role models. And we need to um, uh, look, I, I think, um, particularly at how we are bringing new immigrants into our communities. We need to look at the way we build communities through adhesion and through internal strength, mm -hmm. uh, rather than looking outside of the communities uh, to help. Right. As long as the attitude is that someone else is going to help me, mm -hmm. um, it, it's really hard to build upon the internal strengths that always exist within our communities. Yeah, and just to, to, uh, to build on that a couple of ways, um, a few years ago we took a look at every neighborhood of Boston and what were the most frequent businesses. And as Ted said, there's been a disinvestment in certain neighborhoods that you have businesses leaving the neighborhoods and there's no incentive for them to stay. Uh, and so what we found is that there's some neighborhoods where there are grocery stores, there are banks, there are you know other kinds of businesses that generate you know services. And but when we looked in Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury, the most common businesses were check cashing places and churches. And where's the grocery store? There isn't one. You know, it, and so. Th th there's been a systematic disinvestment in those communities and then on top of that, and this goes back to your violence problem, is that in certain neighborhoods when you call the police they don't come. If you're in Weston, Massachusetts and you call the police, the police are going to be there. And if you're in certain parts of our cities in, in Massachusetts and elsewhere, you call the police and you <coughs> wonder whether they're going to come. And and that makes you feel vulnerable and feel like, oh look, I, you know, I don't want the police to be there all the time, but when I need them, I need them to come. Right. And if they won't come, what good are they? Right. We co we've covered a lot. So I, I would like to continue this conversation, but for the sake of time, I want to transition to the way in which cities across the U.S. have treated this issue of gun violence in inner cities and underserved communities, which has largely been to criminalize it. Let's throw people in jail, and that would act as a deterrent. For example, what Massachusetts did with the one-year mandatory sentencing. Um, from, my from my limited understanding and perspective of the issue, criminalizing the issue entirely as a solution doesn't work. Because if it did, we'll have the safest country in the world because we have the largest prison population in the world. Um, and majority of those people by ratio happen to be black and brown men. And so what are cities missing? Um, what sort of, like you said, services can cities put in place to make sure that their young people are thriving and achieving their full potential and living long enough to actually do that? Um, so I would leave it up to y'all to address that for a bit. So w when we did the, the uh, commission for the speaker, um, we got a prosecutor from the Suffolk County DA's office on the commission. And this was uh, a person who is now a judge, but uh, is, um, was at the time the prosecutor for gang violence. And he came to the meeting and you know, you got the stereotype of what it is. And he said, I'll only stay on this if we get a commitment from everyone that we're not going to increase the penalties for gun violence. That what he said, and we all agreed, was that, as you say, they're far too high already. And he said, what we have to do is find those programs that are working and invest in them and stop. Because, you know, as a criminologist, I'll tell you that one of the big cop-outs in the criminal justice system is when there's a problem, will say, we'll increase the penalties. Because it doesn't cost the politicians anything. To build a new program that's going to work is going to take money. And it's going to take some investment. It's going to take some work to identify the families at risk and to get the services to them. But to say, OK, I'm going to make it from one year to five years, or I'm going to put it at 15 years if you kill someone with a gun, you know, whatever it is, that's really easy for a politician 
it's something that makes them look like they're doing something, maybe to some constituencies, others don't. But that's, that's the easy way out. And one of the things that we were able to do was to take some of the programs that are in the city that deal with the whole family, that deal with you know, um, over people over time, and try to match people with services, and sort of recommend expanding those programs and not doing anything with the penalty structure. You know, maybe lowering it, but not, not certainly not increasing it. Hmm. You know, I think that um, in communities where young people feel they have a future, uh, there is less of a tendency to feel that uh, there's a need to carry a weapon and to use a weapon in a way that leads to gun violence. Mm -hmm. And um, in Boston, one of the disconnects we see uh, is between the wealth that has come into the city primarily through the private sector. I mean, the public sector, the, the, the schools, what have you, do what they can, the social service agencies. But to a very large extent, whether it goes back to the time of busing in the 70s or to now when we see a huge investment coming into the city uh, that's bringing in large numbers of new residents, the private sector has not been nearly as involved in addressing some of the issues and problems that we mm. need to deal with um, as the public sector has. Uh, our real estate firms, our law firms, our banks, our financial institutions, our universities, uh, our uh, private employers who are doing uh, biotech and technology, um, they are bringing resources into the city that are rarely percolating out into communities that really need them. There's a kind of self-serving, self-perpetuating uh, distinction between the wealth of Boston's private sector and the uh, relative poverty that exists in many of Boston's communities. And I think we're at a point where we need to call upon the private sector across the board, mm -hmm. uh, including the universities and the cultural institutions and the financial institutions, uh, to really step up to support uh, the needs that exist in our communities. We can't just look to city government or state government or to the tax structure uh, to solve that. We need active engagement right. and we need fundamental change in the economic and cultural structure of the city that has for so long segregated neighborhoods residentially, not supported public education in the way that it needs to be supported, and enabled lots of folks to come in from outside the city mm -hmm. and to thrive while those people in the city who are victims of gun violence find themselves cut off from and segregated uh, from those assets and resources. And uh, we have a new mayor in place who's bringing some new perspectives into the city. This is a moment, it seems to me, uh, for the whole community to mobilize in a way that transcends the racism that has existed here for decades and really opens up opportunities so that young people don't feel that they have to have a gun in order to have a long-term life opportunity. Ted, I think you've touched on something that has been missing that is an incremental part of this whole conversation, which is the role of the private sector in this. Because even I personally have been looking at this, my frustration has been based on the lack of action from the public sector and our elected officials and policy makers and so on, because that's where the mind goes at first. What are the, our elected officials and decision makers doing about this issue? Yeah, but they're not the ones who have the wealth right. and the resources. Right. And so, like, for example, I know I've had a lot of this conversation with my older brother, and he's always like, well, a huge part of it is the economics that you've talked about. Um, you're growing up with roaches in your, in your neighborhoods, um, rats everywhere, poverty everywhere, drug issues everywhere, mental health issues everywhere and everybody around you is poor. And as a child, you're witnessing that. 
and you want to help out your family, you want to escape that path to dependency on poverty. And so my brother's whole thing is software engineers make so much money. And if kids in these neighborhoods just knew how much opportunity was available to them by going to school and the vast opportunities that are out there that are not just, you know, the ones that we think about maybe lawyer or doctor or something like that, um, or a teacher. Uh, because it wasn't until I went away to St. Lawrence that I started seeing how much possibilities are out there. And it's hard when you're living in these neighborhoods where um, the farthest you've been is from one block to the next block because you're scared of losing your life, to even envision what you could become or how you could escape that path dependency of, of poverty or escape those neighborhoods in which you know, you're coming from. And so I think the private sector ethically should have the moral duty to invest in those communities and inform them of the opportunities that are, that are available to them. And being a software engineer is cool. Right. But being a good plumber is a lifetime occupation Exactly. Too. Being a terrific electrician, exactly. being a good mechanic who understands how to fix some of the digital uh, 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 controls for our automobile engines, making the move towards green jobs. Right. All of those are jobs that have tangible outcomes where one can look to the work you've done and point it out to your brother, to your sister, to your child. This is something I made. Mm -hmm. And we don't do nearly enough, enough of that. to celebrate the work that artisans do and mechanics do. The moment we start to do that and stop thinking about being a software engineer to create the killer algorithm, right? right? <laughs> Uh, that, that, that a VC is going to buy and then you're going to be able to retire at the age of, of 26. Right. The moment we realize that you get a leak in your house and you need to get a good plumber and you look at how much a good plumber earns, mm -hmm. right? That is what builds up communities and right. those jobs can't be outsourced. And they're out there. They're not going away to some uh, foreign country and they recycle money within the community right. in a way that builds up the internal strength of the community. Thank and one you. thing, I, just as, as an example, it's complicated, and one of the things that, that Ted's done his whole career, and I think it's, it's really important, is when we want those communities to reinvest, those businesses to reinvest in the community, they have to do it in cooperation with the community. Right. Um, one of the things, that one of the programs I evaluated a while back was a program that John Hancock did which was called the Summer of Opportunity Program. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful opportunity for young people. They were singled out and they got to go and be paid all for a whole summer and then get a job after that. Right. And they had to go to the John Hancock building to work. And you know what happened? Half of the young people who started the program left it to become a, a, one of the parks people that was you know cleaning trash cans and cutting the grass in the park because the program had them wearing ties and wearing white shirts and that right. wasn't who they were or what they were about and teaching them skills that they would never use now for the john hancock it made sense but because they designed it themselves and then came to the community and said you can have it it was less successful than it could have been right and that speaks to community the importance of community engagement and participatory approach. Um, so we are towards the end of our time. Um, I'm going to give each one of you one to two minutes to offer your last uh, views on this issue, and then we'll wrap it up. So whoever wants to go first. Um, well, I'll jump in by saying that uh, gun violence takes place because people feel that they don't have other opportunities. Uh, and uh, it takes place because uh, young folks in particular feel insecure, uh, not just in the moment, but in terms of their long-term futures. And I think that if we deal with the, with the root causes of that sense of insecurity, mm. the lack of opportunity, the lack of access to good education, uh, the lack of training programs, uh, uh, the, the lack of role models in the community, as you deal with uh, those root causes, I think that at least within our communities, 
we'll see a reduction of gun violence because there won't be the same need to pursue that way mm. of building one's confidence versus another way that uh, has more longevity built into it. And I think that to the extent that we invest in human capital right. and the human infrastructure in our communities, we can see a reduction. That's what helped us to reduce the murder rate in the city uh, when uh, we were working together in, in the Flynn administration. That kind of human infrastructure investment can make a difference. And the private sector and universities and healthcare institutions, cultural institutions, all need to play a role uh, in moving that forward. And, and I guess I, I just say, you know, um, every time there's a shooting at a school or in a shopping mall, it's on the nightly news and we talk about it and people try to think of what can we do to have stopped this young person from doing this. But every day in the cities of our country, young black and brown boys and men are being killed on the streets. They don't make the news. We're not talking about it. We have to elevate that conversation to being the, as much of a priority, if not more, than how do we deal with mass killings? How do we deal with other kinds of gun violence? That's an unseen amount of gun violence that takes place day to day. And as you say, tears families apart, tears neighborhoods apart. And it has to become more of a priority for us to deal with it. Gentlemen, it was great having a conversation with you. Thank you so much for being my first faculty guest in Boston. This was amazing, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. This is great.